because I also hit a point where I didn't want to be isolated and alone anymore. I wanted that for a while. I wanted to walk in and not be seen and walk out. As soon as I was known, it felt like expectation. I had to hightail it out of there. I couldn't handle it. Now it's like, no, I desired. I want those deep, rich relationships. I'm willing to take a calculated risk of vulnerability to get them. And I'm actually able to do it too. And I get to serve and I get to be a part of it. And I'm so thankful by God's grace and His mercy and this commitment to keep going that again, by His grace and His mercy that I have, I'm glad I have that commitment. And to be able to keep moving forward, that I get to enjoy that now in my life when I never thought I might get to do it. And so I pray that for all of you. I hope that for all of you. But please know that you are not lost you are not damaged. You are not any more broken than any other person walking around on this earth right now. And God is going to be there with you right where you are right now. Welcome to the Not Ashamed podcast, where we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We are here to help you rebuild your theology in light of God's grace, love, and the true meaning of holiness. The topic for this month is, what is the role of faith community? We are joined by Naomi Wright, founder of Be Emboldened. Naomi, it is so good to have you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with y'all. Yeah, absolutely. This is a really important conversation. I'm excited to get into it. But before we do, Naomi, would you mind to share a little bit of your background, where you're coming from, um, and just you know the, the three-minute summary of how you came to know Christ? Because you're coming from a, a very different um, group than Andrew or Bethany and I, and I'd love for you to share about that. Yeah, absolutely. So the short version, and feel free to ask follow-up questions if I make it too short, is that I was raised in how I refer to it as a pseudo-Christian cult. So my dad was a, he started his own pretty extreme splinter group of a different group that is out there. And it was extreme enough that he had been excommunicated by it. And so it then kind of went further off the rails as he became the new quote unquote prophet and was going to lead us into the new heavens and the new earth. And so that's how I was raised. Um, Something that was unique from even myself compared to others in our group, which I do call a cult and it does match all of the, you know, whatever we want to pull up for requirements of being a cult, it would match any of them. So um, we, my brother and myself were in public school. And so that was something unique. Most people were homeschooled. And that is something where I look back and it was a blessing in ways that was incredibly difficult at the time. And so we lived a very duplicitous life of hiding what was really going on. Um, As one example, the group was polygamous. And so I have quite a few siblings from quite a few different women. And I had to hide all of that because, of course, that's illegal and problematic in culture as it should be. So that was what I came out of then when I was, I didn't recognize it as a cult until I was 28. I turned 38 here in a week. So it's been at least 10 years that I've known it was a cult, but I started coming out of it at least 20 years ago. So it's been like a kind of a slow process where then it finally like those final pieces clicked into place about 10 years ago. And then getting, you know, my feet under me theologically and all of that ever since. But as far as finding Christ, uh, he really, truly, you guys, I'm not just saying this because it sounds good. He really, truly found me because I just knew Even as a kid, looking at the sun setting behind our maple tree in the backyard and hearing the rustle of the leaves, I just knew the peace I felt in that moment while I was about to have to go knock on my dad's door for dinner. And when that happened, anything could happen. He was a highly abusive person. I knew that that peace was God. I knew that there was something that I wasn't being told about him that was at least also true. Not necessarily that everything else was untrue, which most of it proved to be, but I knew there was something different and I just hadn't been taught that. And so I grew in a love for his love for me. And from there then I I was encouraged on towards the theological aspects. Wow, that is incredible. Thank you for sharing. Um, And I love hearing your story. I've heard it on the Cultish podcast and um, I've heard you, you know, speak on your own podcast, and it's it's amazing what how you know what God brought you out of, um, and how you came to true saving faith in in Christ mm-hmm. and, and knowing Him after a, a 
you know, a cult by everybody's definition kind of background. Um, and just one quick follow-up question. Okay, so if I understand right, the cult that you were raised in was a spinoff of like Branhamism. Um, and I know the Branhamites have outward standards. I'm just curious if that came into your group as well, like a dress code of any sort. Yeah, absolutely. So all of that stuff applied. So no, some of the the ones that people maybe still have some conflict with, even within mainstream denominations like piercing or tattoos or things like that, of course, were off the table. But also I was not permitted to cut my hair, not even trimming, which I know in some places trimming is allowed. That was not allowed for us. The long skirts past the knees. Um, anything to like even things like, say, women shaving their legs, things like that would be considered vanity and just to avoid anything like that. So, yes, a lot of outward standards as well as we didn't celebrate any holidays. All holidays were pagan. I do make a joke that we we did celebrate Thanksgiving, but I was like, my dad liked to eat. It was just like a good food day. I really had nothing to do with anything else, but we didn't celebrate birthdays, nothing like that. Nothing that was really kind of drawing attention to ourselves as interesting as that is because we believed we were the elite, which was obviously the the biggest pride boost of all, right? The biggest ego boost. But yeah, other than that, it was be as unattractive as you possibly can. <laughs> uh, Bethany and Andrew, isn't it interesting how we came out of these groups that, you know, people still, some people still see them as, you know, normal Christianity or whatnot, but we can still relate to these splinter sects. Absolutely. Yeah, and I see a lot of parallels in the group that I came out of. So um, knowing just a little bit about Branhamism, I know we uh, vary on like uh, theological stances. Um, and I guess out of the broader part of the uh, denomination that my church comes out of, some people wouldn't consider it um, an outright cult, maybe problematic in some churches, cultish. Um, but I see a lot of the parallels out of, out of your story and, and my story uh, coming out of, of the church that I came from that was very uh, toxic. Yeah. Um, and then, Naomi, from your experience, you founded Be Bolden. Could you just take a couple minutes and tell us what that is and what you offer? Yeah, Be Bolden was, well, not on my radar to start, but it happened. <laughs> and I say it that way because I, up until 35, which is when I launched Be Emboldened, I had not shared the truth of my story with people I had known for a very long time. So going public with it was a huge deal. It was incredibly stressful. There was a lot that went into me making that choice and a lot that went into my process of actually doing it. From there, well, and I want to add really what I started on was I felt like God was was telling me to share what he had done for me. And I remember just having that sense and just being like, I mean, it's the least I can do. So yeah, I'm going to do that. And from there, it just, I kept having increased sort of vision for the organization and what could be offered and then continue to see what more, you know, more needs that were out there beyond my personal story. And it's just continued to grow from there. So currently we are a 501c3, which I know y'all are now too, which is super exciting. So we got that in, we're just hitting two years actually this month of having that. We launched about two and a half years ago, two years as a 501c3. And we're currently offering different curriculums that we've written. We have our first coming out as a, I'm not sure when this is releasing, but first coming out in a digital online course version in July and two or three new curriculums launching in the fall. So that's one way that would be more of a small group, you know, handful of people, maybe 12 max where we get to go through different questions and things for healing and rebuilding as well from kind of just day-to-day -day functioning as well as big questions about faith and things like that. We are also offering one-on-one -on -one mentoring services for individuals who themselves have suffered or people who know someone who has been harmed and they are trying to support or walk alongside somebody who's maybe still involved in a problematic group.
Additionally, we offer consulting for someone who's on the professional side. So other support professionals of any kind, it can be someone in the church, it could be someone who's a therapist, whatever that may look like, um, a dietitian, you know, whatever, where someone's having crossover with someone who's experienced spiritual abuse. And we can offer that consulting support to them as they're trying to make it more of an area of expertise. Because I think as we all know, it's pretty nuanced of an area and it's not as talked about as it needs to be. So sometimes people appreciate that help. We have our first getaway coming up, which again, I don't know when this releases, but that is in June. Maybe when you listen to this, it was in June, um, but that is the first kind of retreat that we're offering again for a small group of people. And moving forward, I'm really excited to be heading into supporting leadership. And that's a direction that we're going to be opening up here um, and offering more in-person services. So I'm kind of figuring out how much travel we'll be doing, but I think we're traveling like five times this year and I've capped it out and we'll see what that looks like next year. But there's just nothing like being able to sit with people in person as nice as virtual is. And I'm so thankful for it. Being able to connect with the people in person is just something that I really love and value. And so we're trying to do that too as much as we can, including coming to your conference coming up. Yeah, called the Freedom. And I'm so excited that it looks like you're going to be able to come um, and especially to participate in the conversation on recognizing spiritual abuse and uh, recovering from it. Cause that is such an important topic. And I know you're, that's kind of your thing. You know, that's what you, you work with and you're in our eyes, an expert in that more than many people I know. So I'm really excited. It looks like you're going to be able to come and participate in that. So in speaking of spiritual abuse, um, I'd like to shift the conversation now. And I want to talk about just real quick, quick uh, revictimization, because that's something I've heard you sp speak on before. And I think it's really uh, relevant to our audience because there's a saying, uh, be careful of what feels like home if you grew up in an abusive home. And I think that's really relevant if you're leaving an abusive, spiritually abusive church. Um, there's a tendency to just, when you're looking for a new church, go back to something that's authoritarian, that's, that's not helpful um, or healthy. And that's, I think, what we would call re-victimization. But I'm, I'd love to hear that just... Uh, defined in, in your words, Naomi, um, and then we'll get some some input from Andrew and Bethany also of, you know, how we've seen this happen for people who are leaving the, the hyper-fundamentalist groups. So it can look like different things, but I think generally speaking, kind of going like bigger picture, I would describe re-victimization as someone who has experienced religious harm of some sort. So whether it's, we, it would be abuse or it would be something that was, you know, again, we can, I, I get a little hesitant with different terms because different people will be comfortable with some terms for themselves and others they wouldn't be. But if someone has come out of a kind of authoritarian environment, if maybe that's something we could all come together on, and they haven't really gotten their feet under them as to what was that and what about it should I bring forward with me? And what about it should I be leaving behind? I think that is the prime time for re-victimization to happen because we don't yet know what to do with it all. And so we can absolutely let you just, like you just said, Natalie, go into an environment that maybe is too similar, but there's that sense of familiarity. And that's something I was actually just speaking to my husband about recently was I'm like, you know, we can have the sense of familiarity and familiarity is comfortable, but familiarity isn't necessarily good mm. because we can be comfortable with things that are really toxic and unhealthy and even dangerous. And so we see that with all kinds of abuses. So re-victimization is that period of time where someone is at an increased risk of putting themselves in an environment or getting kind of wooed into an environment potentially by a wolf, a leader who is going to prey upon them because they haven't yet had that opportunity to really root themselves in what's true. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And that makes it make a lot of sense and also makes sense why it happens. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrew, I'm curious if this is something you've observed, maybe had some experience to some level with, uh, especially watching people who are leaving the very strict hyper-fundamentalist apostolic churches. Um, have you ever seen re-victimization? Absolutely. 
Um, and it's, it's really disheartening, you know, and, and when you're trying to wrestle with all these, uh, emotions and these thoughts, right? Like it's not a very clean cut process for a lot of people. And so, um, as you mentioned, Naomi, there's like a lot of comfort and familiarity. And sometimes people opt to go back to something that feels, uh, relative to what they've already experienced. And I saw that when I left, um, there were the initial inclinations of, well, maybe this church community wasn't right, but if we, under the same denomination, under the same umbrella, we could find something similar that might be healthy. And I remember there was a lot of confusion um, and some folks that didn't understand why we had left, you know, for doctrinal reasons, uh, they always uh, would reach out and they would try to make the uh, suggestion that, well, you know, just make sure that you're under the right covering was the kind of language that we use within our circles. Like, make sure that you're under uh, a spiritual authority. Um, and it's very limiting because you understand what they mean, even though it's kind of like an ambiguous terminology that they'll, they'll throw at you. They really, they, they know intuitively as, as did I when they suggested that they, they want you to find another environment that parallels how it operates where we came from. And so it, it's very uh, traumatizing to go through that again and try to find yourself, put yourself, re-victimize yourself in a, in a similar environment because of this desire to have something familiar and comfortable. Yeah, so I've definitely seen it where someone is in a church group um, that's not healthy. You know, it's at the core. It's the theology of the group is wrong and that is manifesting. Um, and, and, you know, there's an outflow of uh, authoritarian, toxic behavior that comes from the root of the bad theology. But they'll try to convince themselves, you know, because they're so loyal to the group. Well, it, maybe it was just this church. If I could just try another church. Um, and it's so sad because I usually, you know, in my experience with Berean holiness and of course our mission is to try to help people into healthy mainstream, um, Christianity who are leaving these, uh, sex, these very unhealthy hyper fundamentalist sex, um, as well as cults, uh, more and more. But anyways, when I, when people are, I think the most at risk, the most vulnerable to just leaving faith entirely it's not usually the first bad experience they have it's the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth and that's when they're like yeah so christianity is toxic and i'm leaving everything um and that's so tragic and i think that's just reiterates the importance to us of doing everything we can to try to help people not be re-victimized um so they don't have that disheartening discouraging experience of going through abuse all over again and God forbid, concluding that that's just Christianity and not, you know, an unhealthy church. So going on, there's there's a tension here that I really want to address in this conversation. We have we have two pitfalls, um, <laughs> such as every area of life. We have the pitfall on one side of my friends that just totally give up on the church. And I'm, I'm seeing more people who don't give up on God per se, or still want to be Christians, but they completely give up on faith. Like I just mentioned a lot of times because they've been re-victimized, they just give up on the church. Um, and so for, for those, we definitely in this conversation want to talk about the importance of faith community um, for us as individuals and as, as a body of Christ, how that's important. But then on the other side of uh, the, the coin, the other pitfall is this idolizing of church attendance and to the point of shaming and fear tactics and guilt to get people to be in church, you know, three, four, five times a week. Um, and their whole faith being dependent upon the church attendance. I mean, not even having a healthy, balanced Christian life, um, but just so fixated on church attendance. And so we want to address both. Um, but we'll start with the the pitfall of the temptation to think that faith community is not important. Um, so Naomi, my first question is for you, according to scripture, what is the purpose of faith community or you could call it fellowship with other believers? 
Yeah. So Natalie, I know we're going to talk about this more. And so I want to, I want to preface what my answer is going to be with, if you're listening to this, please stay tuned for the rest of the conversation. Because I would never say any of what I'm about to say without saying of what without saying what I'm going to be saying later. Okay, so for anyone who is in a place, and I'll put it this way: for anyone who's in a place where attending another church community would be safe for them to do, but is maybe thinking, I just don't know that there's any benefit, any reason, any need. Maybe that's their position right now. And that certainly happens, especially if someone has gone quite some time without. They could think, well, I just don't know. Like maybe I'm living a pretty full life in ways or I work a lot or, you know, I'm very involved with with family, whatever that may look like. We're like, gosh, I just don't know that that's needed. Now, I would also offer that church can look like different things. So in some ways, maybe you are already living out being a part of the the body of Christ and being interconnected. But if you're someone who's not, and so that's really what I'm sort of contexting this for, if that's a word, being able to gather with others to worship the Lord is incredibly powerful and beautiful and sanctifying and being able to come together. And again, I would say so much more about this to anyone who has experienced religious abuse, but repentance, being able to take communion together, being able to repent. And again, y'all, for any of these words where you're like, uh, mm -mm, not me, not the way I've heard it, I hear you. I've had it too. Again, please don't shut us off because there's a lot more. I'm, I'm talking kind of succinctly for this specific question. There's a lot more that would be said about any of this. So being able to gather together corporately to worship for someone who is wanting to align their life with the call of scripture, it also is a call to do that. So there is in scripture a call for us to gather corporately as a body to worship Lord, the Lord. So how are we doing that? Again, it can look like different things. It looks like different things in different countries. It doesn't look like it does in the United States everywhere. It doesn't have to look like that everywhere here in the United States either, but gathering with other people. So that is absolutely an important piece of coming together as a community. A couple other things that stand out the most to me is that... The relationship, what those relationships do for us. There is something about like, I live in a new area. My family moved not that long ago. We don't really know anyone where we are. And this past weekend, we drove a few hours to go see some really incredible people who are also fellow believers. And we got to spend some time with them. I am not kidding you, you guys. And I'm sure that you all can imagine this. Within just that 24 hours, I felt like I was a better version of myself. Just in those 24 hours, being able to be with other people who are also striving to live out their lives as Christ has called us to, there is such a strengthening in those relationships. And it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to have them in some sort of church community context where we have that regularity of gathering together because life does get so busy. It does get so full. And so it helps make sure that it's going to happen. And again, I have felt it just in real time and real life. Like, wow, it makes a difference. I left feeling more encouraged to be alive. <laughs> That's, I actually texted them after. I'm like, I'm more encouraged just about being alive because life can get draining and tiring and no one has to be worried. I'm not saying I don't want to be alive, but I just felt more like fueled for it for what life involves. And that's something that community can offer to us. And I thank God because what God does over and over again is he calls us to do things. And he says, be obedient to this, do these things. They always benefit us. They're always for our good. And I'm so thankful for, for that. He's not asking us to do things that he doesn't bless us for doing. Whether it's external, internal, we are blessed internally for doing them. I'm so thankful for that. And I think the last thing that I want to speak to is as along with just that, that feeling good and it just being nice to gather with like in that strengthening that comes, there's also strengthening in that accountability piece of just that honesty and that transparency of where we're struggling, where we need prayer, where we need some tangible 
helps as well. And just being able to have that with one another and that solidarity, it helps get rid of that isolation, feeling like we're alone. And I think for many of us, we have felt that at some point in our journey. And so again, for anyone where it is safe to seek that out again, I would absolutely encourage it. Again, I mean, I could take it right back to Christ calls us to, you know, scripture calls us to gather. If that's not reason enough for where you are with your theology right now, check it out anyway, because just again, like consider what I'm saying that if he's called you to do it, there's a reason for it. So please explore that more. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, And Andrew, I'd love to get some of your feedback on what Naomi just said, and also just as an as well, your thoughts on the question of what is the value of faith community um, in general, and especially in the context of the local church? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I'm glad that you preempted that, Naomi, that um, I think, too, it is important that you are considerate of yourself coming out of the environment that you've come out of, because uh, there are a lot of people that are coming out of hyper-fundamentalism that are trying to recollect their ideology and their thoughts about Christianity. And it's a lot to untangle. And so just throwing yourself into into, uh, another situation without kind of figuring that out can sometimes be harmful. Uh, But at the same, on the same token, I I think it would be, um, uh, it it wouldn't be a good thing to disregard congregating with, uh, with people of Christ um, with like-minded people, uh, cause the scripture encourages it and there are a lot of benefits to it. Um, but you know, when you've untangled those ideas and those thoughts and you're ready to kind of engage in a healthy way, uh, some of the things that I think are really beneficial and you've touched on a lot of them already, um, is, um, one of the things I was thinking about when, uh, you were talking about feeling part of a community is uh, one of the biggest things that we see in outside of the church. Um, let's just use, for example, um, like there's this unanimous feeling for a lot of people that come out of a high school, right? That they tend to have this feeling of like loss, a void of community, right? Because they were thrown into this system that kind of forced them into uh communing with people, you know, it wasn't of their own volition. It's something that they were just mandated to do by their parents. And there are relationships that are formed in it, you know, and it is for a universal benefit, right. To educate them. Um, and then, so a lot of times people come out of school systems and if they don't go to college or go into the military or something like that immediately afterwards, uh, there's this unanimous feeling. A lot of people will, will regard as feeling like there is a void there. And so for that simple fact, I think there, there is something good to, to be found in a healthy community just for the fact of um, interacting with people uh, that are like-minded. Um, but to elevate that even further from a spiritual standpoint and from a biblical standpoint, uh, you mentioned uh, accountability, right? I think that's one of the most difficult things that we have as Christians to carry out a Christian lifestyle um, is if we don't have accountability, um, we're left to our own devices. And there's a lot of scriptures that encourages that. Um, so we don't want to disregard that. We want to find a healthy place where that we can, we can engage in that. Um, and there's a couple other points that I could probably make, you know, a place to, to fellowship, which is what we just talked on a uh, place to worship collectively. Um, I mean, just look at, the function of the church throughout history before modern day. You know, this is um, the church facilitated a large part of the community in, in a different way that the mainstream church does today. So um, before I go into all of that and just splinter off into different subjects, it's just, I, I think there is a lot of value to find a good, healthy Christian community. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and some of the, I, I just want to touch on some of the scriptures that you both alluded to, um, but I was able to just 
copy them into my notes. Um, so for worship, I think of Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. In the church context, it's just a beautiful you know, regular reminder to do that um, and a place to do that. Otherwise, you know, when, even when I'm fellowshipping with my Christian friends, I, you know, it's not usually top of my mind to sing to them, uh, you know, worship songs like we were commanded to do. Um, but the church is just a beautiful reminder to do that and to sing together and encourage and admonish each other. I definitely think of accountability and discipline. Um, that's another part that a, a healthy structured church um, can have. Now, not all churches honestly do this well, but it's something that can be done well. Um, because, you know, if I'm, if I feel the need to be encouraged, at least I'm motivated, you know, to go to my Christian friends and say, Hey, I'm down. You know, I could really use some encouragement, but when I've sinned, um, and I need to be held accountable and I need uh, discipline, I'm not really internally motivated to just choose to go to my friends. And it's much better for there to be some structure for that. Some churches even have like accountability partners or, you know, um, a discipleship context where you, you know, my husband meets with the men's group and that's something our church offers and they offer similar ministries for women. And, you know, on that uh, regular meeting time, we can get together and be like, Hey, you know, how are you doing in this area of your life or that area I mean, even something like spiritual disciplines and just to compassionately care for one another, listen to one another and hold each other account accountable um, to living a healthy Christian life, which is good for all of us. Um, I definitely think of James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Um, of course, there's Matthew 18, 15 through 19. And then edification, Ephesians 4 is um, a great passage for that just a couple of verses and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of, of doctrine, which is, you know, false doctrine. And then it goes Paul goes on to talk about speaking the truth in love and growing into Christ. And in 16, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And then, of course, we have 1 Corinthians 12. And I just think of, you know, so many analogies in the New Testament about we're a body. Um, we're different, but we worked together. So it's it's beautiful to have a place where we can come together and be intentional about building each other up. Encouragement and support. Um, I think of Romans 1.12, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Hebrews 10.25, Romans 15.1 through 2, um, and then Galatians 6, 1 and 2. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um, and then I won't read all the scriptures, but there's also uh, physical care and support for one another. I think of, and also outreach to our local community. Um, I think of Matthew 25. I think of James 127 about, you know, pure religion, including caring for the widow and the fatherless. And I, then I think of Acts, you know, 6, 1 through 3, where they had the issue with the widows not being taken care of. And so the church stepped in to make sure that was happening. And then, of course, we have outreach and discipleship, Matthew 28, 19 through uh, 20 being a great passage for that. So before we move on, um, to look at the other pitfall, do either of you have any added thoughts about the benefit of faith community? I do not, honestly. I think you covered it well, and I really appreciate you bringing the scriptures into it. I hope that people are able to reference those, go back and check them for themselves, and think about, yeah, I mean, this intersects with all of our lives. It applies to all of us. So what can that look like? Yeah, thank you. And I, I think just a quick add on to that, too, I think what you mentioned is also a really good rubric to look at your existing church community. And if those things aren't going on, 
that that could tell be telling of whether you're in a healthy place or not, because these are things that the Bible, these are expectations that we have as uh, Christians to be seeing in our church. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's really what I want to get into. That's one of my points. Um, So let's transition and talk about myths about church attendance, Um, because I have seen some really unhealthy ideas about church attendance um, in the groups that I come from, where where I'm familiar with. And Naomi, I'm really curious to see uh, how much this will overlap with your experience coming from Mm -hmm. a cult. Um, So I'll just go ahead and, and get started. So, man, I'll just I'll just be kind of candid off script. So I I made a post today on Berean holiness and I was just asking people, you know, what was the frequency uh, that you were expected to be in church? Did that take away from other areas of your life? And it was really just questions. All it was. Um, And I had people in the comment section that were so upset. It honestly surprised me. I'm I'm not used to. Like, I'm not unfamiliar with people being upset with me, but just, you know, for me to ask these questions and for them to respond so vehemently, I was really taken aback. Like, whoa, this was a lot more sensitive than I thought it was going to be. And the ones that were responding with such uh, fervor were more from the hyper fundamentalist side of the spectrum. Um, And as I was trying to process their comments, because it was just a lot of like, church attendance is not optional, you know, with exclamation points, like, and I was trying to boil down this whole uh, comment section to like, what is, what is bothering me about this comment section? So I won't, I won't read every comment to you guys, but I'll just read like after I sat with it for a while, uh, my takeaways from what I was really hearing these uh, commenters say was that, and this is what I, this is the narrative that I grew up with. And Naomi, I'm really curious if this is something you've heard. So first, um, your love for God is measured by your church attendance. Your serving God, how we serve God is all through church attendance. Our spirituality is measured by our church attendance. Um, and how we spend time with God is by going to church. For example, we had comments saying, um, you know, I love the Lord. I want to spend time with him. So of course I go to church four times a week. Um, and I was like, that's it. So there was this underlying of idea of this is like the only way that we can spend time with God is we go to his house. He's at his house. So we go visit him at his house. That's kind of the underlying narrative there that, you know, I found that that's wait, that's hold on. Something's wrong here. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but I think that's why, you know, when people leave an unhealthy church, they're panicked to get to another church ASAP because they feel like they don't have, they've left God and they have to go back to his house, you know, even if they jump back into another unhealthy group, because they feel like they're lost without him there without him. If they're not in a church building, I'm just wondering if you've seen any of these, uh, kind of fixations on, you know, we have to be at church. That's where God is. So Natalie, I've seen the struggle of people feeling guilty for not being at church and feeling like, yes, God is not going to want to meet them where they're at because they're being disobedient in some way. Simultaneously, they're not going. So I think that may be something we're seeing that's different. The people that be emboldened is primarily serving, they're really struggling to attend. And so they generally are not, at least for a period of time, but they're not okay with that. So we're coming alongside them, you know, through that that journey. As far as myself, because I know you had mentioned that in the beginning, and if that was similar messaging that I received, I would say that I have to I have to kind of give an asterisk that being the daughter of the leader puts a different spotlight on. So son too, although women were the worst, we were compared to hogs. So like being the daughter was worse than being the son. But yeah, there was a lot of attention on we have to be there. So 
I got all kinds of threats and awful things said if I did not attend when I got older or if as a young girl, I fell asleep or something, you know, that was a really big deal. But it was less overall, the sense that I got of the messaging was that it was not necessarily that time with God outside wasn't also worthy. It was like we had this Bible game that we would play and we definitely read the Bible stories. I mean, all of that was really encouraging. Definitely. I grew up with a sense that there was value to that. It counted for whatever it was counting for because I didn't really get it, but it counted. But there was this hierarchy of, but you're closer to my dad if you attend everything. Mm. And if you're always present and you stay all the way till the end and then you stay and you chat and then you do this and you do that and you do that and so it's like then you're closer to him well if you're closer to him then you're closer to god so you've won you know so there was that hierarchical thing kind of going on with everybody so but it had to do with your dad interestingly enough because he was the cult leader is that what i'm hearing a hundred percent because he was seen as a prophet of as the prophet of god that was on the earth in this day and age not this day and age because he's passed away, but whatever that would have been before he passed away. Yes. So it was really about, and it was, that was interesting too, because he would directly say like, no one's getting anywhere on my shirt tails or on my coattails. Like you all have to have your own relationship with God, but that's definitely not in action fully what it was looking like. It wasn't fully not either, but it wasn't fully looking like that. Hmm. That is so interesting. So there was, um, there was a comment uh, that was, I asked people, what kind of sayings have you heard? Um, and there was one saying that multiple people posted today. And I think those people were from totally different backgrounds, totally different parts of the United States. So I'm, I'm really curious um, if, Andrew, if, if you've heard this uh, where you grew up, but it, the saying goes like this. You can tell how popular the church is by those attending Sunday morning. You can tell how popular the pastor is by who comes Sunday night. You can tell how popular Jesus is by those who come Wednesday night. Andrew, did you ever hear any messaging like that? Yeah, we use a lot of similar phrasing. Uh, maybe not the exact words, but the sentiment was there that um, it was those special services, right? Like if you were dedicated, you know, your periphery, you'll attend Sunday service. That's just what average Christians do. But Sunday p.m., you know, you're more dedicated. And if you're there Wednesday and at my church, we had it like, you know, we had a Monday night prayer. We had Tuesday night or Tuesday morning prayer, Wednesday service, Thursday teachings. It's like um, you really had to to push the gambit to prove how loyal you were to Christ. And in reality, we find later it's your loyalty to uh, the pastorship or the leadership. Oh, that's interesting. It being, it really coming down to how loyal you were to the church and to the pastor. And I'd agree with you. Um, Andrew, I know in the churches I grew up in, we had, we had like three or four times a year, we would have meetings. Honestly, it might've been more than that. I'm counting off the top of my head. Might've been, ooh, like five times. Um, but when we had a special meeting, we would have five to seven church services back to back in a row, and we were required to be at every single one. Uh, is that something you also had, Andrew, in the apostolic churches? Absolutely. Yeah, we would have this routine uh, a annual thing, and multiple times a year, not just one time, but we'd have what we'd call like revival set of services, and the expectation was uh, we'd do weeks-long services where you're going Monday through um, for us, it was Monday through Thursday, uh, but there were times where it would be all the way month, like Sunday to Sunday. Um, you, you were expected to be there, and we were, you know, keeping tabs on people and recognizing, oh, so and so is not here. Um, and we kind of all knew the subtext when we were saying that to one another that like they're not dedicated, they're not holy, there's something wrong there. Yeah, I absolutely grew up with these narratives. I'm another comment um in from today was someone said quoting what they'd been told if your salvation won't get you to church three times a week i doubt it will get you to heaven um naomi i'm curious on your thoughts of these kind of mantras that we grew up around they're so harmful because they're works-based now there's a difference between scripture saying gather 
and saying that salvation is based on gathering. Those aren't equal statements. And so it sets up, one, a works-based theology, and two, it sets you up to only be hearing the voice of one man versus being able to talk with others. And there is wisdom and hearing others' voices. Now, I'm not saying that as in go join culture. That's not what I mean. I'm saying there is wisdom and discernment in being able to speak with other people and even work that through of, do I agree? Why? Do I disagree? Why? There is more than one person on this earth at this time who is speaking the truth of God. We are doing that this evening with humility. And so to say, I'm going to go all of these nights of the week to listen to this single person, or maybe it's this person and an associate, and I'm going to hear everything just from them. We're putting ourselves in what ultimately is going to become an echo chamber. Now, it may not be initially because you may come in new. Maybe you're not born there. Maybe you enter into it in your 20s. And so it's not an echo chamber at first, but you're learning it. And then suddenly it becomes one. And that is really a disservice to your sanctification process with the Lord. Wow. Yeah. Great point. Um, The echo chamber. I was going to make this point later, but I'll bring it up now. Uh, When the more I work with people who are coming out of cults or just really toxic authoritarian places, you talk about the echo chamber. There's something about when you go to church three and four times a week. Um, and especially if you're part of the ministry and <laughs> Andrew, you know, you know all about the whole church being part of the ministry, quote unquote. Um, but when that happens, especially if you are part of the ministry, especially if you're actually active in it and not just claiming it, um, there's so much work to do. Like I remember, you know, after I graduated Bible school, helping at churches, um, and I still didn't do as much as others did, but still like it, it takes up you know, half of your evenings in your whole Sunday, you know, most of the churches we went to because they were hard to find, we had to drive an hour to get there and an hour home. A lot of times we would leave at, you know, nine in the morning, if not eight 30, um, get to church, go to church, uh, go out to eat, stay at the church, have the prayer meeting before the nighttime church, go to the nighttime church, um, and then try to hang out after church, um, and get home at mm, 10, 11 o'clock at night, you know, depending. Um, so, and, and then, like I said, the evenings, um, and then we would visit other churches too. So there were times in my life we went to church <laughs> at least three, four times a week easily because we went to our services and then a neighboring church's service, but it's still the same echo chamber um, of views and you don't have time to go anywhere else. Um, so it really, it consumes your whole life. Naomi, I'm just curious, just the more of the short answer. Have you seen cults use this as an actual tactic to just consume their whole, all their members' time? So you really don't have time um, to make outside connections and go to outside events because your whole life is absorbed in the group. And so much of your week, your evenings, your weekend is absorbed in the group. Have you seen that used as con- a way to control? Absolutely. 100%. It's an intentional tactic. And another one that, that, well, another uh, win that the leader gets when they function this way is that people are also tired. So it's not just their time, but they're tired. And if you think about it, I mean, POWs, they get sleep deprivation as one of their cruel and unusual, you know, torture tactics. And oftentimes in cults, we will see that people are just so darn tired. When you're really tired, you're not thinking clearly. You don't have the energy or the capacity to be asking questions, to be wondering, to be thinking for yourself. So it also makes you a lot easier to control. Mm. That is a really good point. I mean, I've actually seen this backfire during COVID. There are so many people that we've been talking to, helping, offering resources to, who are leaving these groups. And we've asked them, uh, when was it that you started to reevaluate your beliefs? And they said, well, it was during COVID because we weren't in church four times a week. And for the yeah. first time, we had time to study and think about it. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, I'm wondering if you have any feedback on that. Absolutely. I think that's kind of more where my uh, journey kind of jump started even further because I had always had questions as a young person. Um, but then because of your time being consumed, being involved in ministry, 
Uh, you never get an opportunity to study that out. And when COVID came around, it was a perfect opportunity. And at this time, I was leading um, uh, our church's youth group. And so I felt a responsibility to also study the scripture because I didn't want to go before the young people and teach them something that I didn't understand fully myself. And that's where I started finding conflict and re- recognizing, hey, there, this is not biblical, what we've been teaching. And, of course, you run into obstacles because the leadership is unwilling to discuss these things or they have these phrases that kind of uh, brush those things under the rug and say, well, well, we'll come to it later. Like, really, if your heart is open or all kinds of phrases to kind of cover it up. Like, if you, you know, seek with a, you know, uh, a, a, a willing heart, you know, or, or similar phrases kind of that to that, that God will reveal it to you. But it never was satisfactory, you know, and the deeper I went into it, the more I realized, hey, this, this isn't, this isn't biblical, you know. Yeah. So I want to address something um, on this point. So one of the comments today was making fun of our post, you know, asking the questions that I mentioned. And the di- the the man commenting said, the subtext in this post reads, I don't want to feel guilty for missing church. I want to do what I want. And if I can blame the church for cre- that I attend for creating some toxic, he put in quotes, environment, I can use that as an excuse to do what I want, and that'll be great. How dare the pastor want me to be in church? So, of course, it was a satire, um, being satirical. But anyways, I, you know, I started to think about that, and I was like, wow, it's really interesting. People think I'm trying to get out of coming to church by, you know, pushing back a little bit on, like, hey, maybe it's not you know, a salvific issue for us to go to church four times a week. And people just respond to that to, oh, you're feeling guilty. Um, so this is about you wanting to miss church. And I find it ironic um, because, number one, I love the church I'm at today. Um, and, yes, we go there on a regular basis, and I really enjoy it. Um, but then also, even when I was in the strict churches, I loved going to church. And it, most especially when I was a preteen Teen, the two churches we went to during that time, that was all my friends. I homeschooled, so that was like my entire community. I didn't see, a lot of times, I didn't see anyone my age throughout the week. And then on, you know, the Sundays and all the weekday nights that we would drive to go to a church service, that's when I would see people, and I, I loved it. I was involved in the music ministry. I loved it. Um, I just really enjoyed going to church as a kid. So this isn't from a place of, man, I hated to go to church all the time. But this is what's interesting. This is where I want to take the conversation next. So when I started to question, should Christians go to church services three, four, five times a week? And more specifically, should we be coerced into going to church services that many times a week? Um, I started to rethink and reevaluate when I was um, transitioning more into ministry, so during Bible school, after Bible school, because I was so excited and really trying to get churches to do local outreach, to do community outreach, um, share the gospel, like just going out into town and sharing the gospel with people, um, evangelism, that street evangelism, I think it'd be called, um, but one-on-one. And I was trying to, to encourage people to do this and trying to find people who would do it with me. Um, trying to find people who would do a kids outreach with me at the park um, and trying to find people who would do a, like a community group type thing um, or a Bible study. And again and again and again, the pushback that I got was, Natalie, you are so insensitive of people's schedules. They already come to church three and four times a week. How can we ask them to also give up their Saturdays? Uh, that's their yard day. That's their only family day. Um, how can we ask them to, you know, come early to church to also do, you know, I had an apologetics club at, at one point, this kind of thing. And some people were receptive of it, but we were like really had to, it was hard. It was hard. Um, and that that's what made me step back and think, wow, we go to church three and four, sometimes depending on revivals, um, five times a week. And we have no time for community outreach. We have no time to serve our communities practically. We have no time for discipleship, for mentorship. Um, very little time, you know, to try to share the gospel in our communities. A very little time to disciple our families. And that's, man, that's one thing that really made me think was these people who were preaching so adamantly, you need to be there every time the doors are open. Um, we've grown up now. 
and their children are lost. Uh, for a lot, not everyone, but for a lot, their children are completely burnt out on church and gone. They lost their family. They prioritize church so much, but for the whole seven services a week, especially if there's an evangelist child, you know, going to church seven times a week. And I had people comment today. I had people message today and say, hey, I grew up, you know, every almost every night of the week I was in a church service due to ministry. And I was so burnt out and sick of church. And I never some people have so sad message like I never spent time with my parents. They never made time for me. Um, others said, you know, I lost my kids because all we did is go to church and now they're far from God. And I regret that so much. And it was heartbreaking. Um, so much emphasis on go to church, go to church, go to church, and not on a healthy, balanced Christian life, which includes ministering to our own families, spending time with them, discipleship, life on life. Uh, Naomi, I'm, I'm really curious your thoughts on that. I mean, PKs don't have the rep that they have for no reason. So preacher kids, there's a lot, a lot out there, um, including statistics on children who were raised with parents who are doing vocational ministry and they themselves did not get ministered to. It's a huge problem. It's a, something that we've been very aware of in our household is making sure that our discipling our child is going to come before we disciple anyone else. And I don't say that lightly and I don't say it easily. I'm not saying that it's not difficult. It's not hard to make those decisions day to day and figure out how to weigh which emergency versus what else is needed. And so I don't say that without any empathy, without any grace. But it is, it's a huge problem. And I have to say that people who, not these people that you're referring to, not these ones, Natalie, that have reached out to you, but the leaders who are pushing this kind of lifestyle, I just have a hard time believing that it's not their goal that these relationships would fall apart because they're looking for allegiance to themselves. They're looking for allegiance to their doctrine, to their agenda, to what they're doing. And whether it's like premeditated or whether it's a subconscious thing. Now, if I went to one of those leaders and I said, you know what, I've lost my child. My child is turned away because I have spent all of my time here at the church. I wonder how many of those leaders, and I don't know, hopefully I'd be surprised by how few, but I do wonder how many would respond, well, you've been faithful and they haven't been, so God's will be done. I don't know that they would recognize the part that they have played in this result and that if a life is lost because of it, there's accountability for that. And that accountability is going to have something to do with them as well because they are in leadership and James 3.1 is not a joke. Yeah. Man, um, I'm going to go on to another point, and Andrew, I'm going to want your take on this. So another myth on church attendance is that church attendance is always is faith community. They're, like they're always synonymous. It's always the same thing. Going to church and um, faith community fellowship with other believers is always the same. And I'm going to argue, and I have to do it succinctly, so people are probably going to misunderstand, and I guess that's okay. But they're not always one and the same. There are some churches that, as much as they preach against movie theaters, kind of operate like one um, in the sense that we all go to the building. We all sit beside each other. We all watch the preaching, the show at the front. Um, maybe we shout and then we leave. And honestly, it's some churches I've been to the most connecting with other people was at McDonald's afterwards. If we got to go out to eat and let me just be honest, we didn't talk about Jesus <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so Andrew is this something you've seen as well where church attendance but as much as we parade it as fellowshipping with other believers sometimes it's completely lacking true connection right and I, I think uh, that's one of the, the most devastating things about um, what I would kind of categorize as the, like the modern day uh, uh, church right and not to go too deep into because this is something that was it kind of is a um, a triggering point for for me because at my church we were like really adamant about preaching against those like those those uh, those mainstream churches you know serving coffee in the coffee bar oh my goodness you know like they're 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 leading people to hell um, but there is something to the fact that like community needs to be facilitated 
in these churches. And, and if we look back at the uh, historical Christianity, uh, the churches were designed to be like the centers of communities. Um, that's why we even have like the advent of the steeple. You know, people, it, it glosses over people that why we even built the churches the, the way that we did. Um, it's because it was like a sign to the community. Like this, this is where things are happening. And so I think there is a danger that like we have churches and um, it's kind of ironic that the fundamentalist churches would be the ones that like rage against the churches that serve coffee and stuff like that. Um, and yet they're the ones that don't facilitate community. In fact, at the church that I came from, um, where it was really toxic, I mean, they 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 uh, did away with Sunday school. Um, and that was one of the, the biggest things during COVID. They were like, you know, no more Sunday school. They reduced how often we met for youth. Uh, so our youth groups were, they reduced to meeting only twice, twice a month. We did absolutely zero outreach. And all of our connect groups that we used to have, those were uh, disseminated altogether. And so literally the only time we were meeting was for, uh, for preaching. And, um, you know, it's really, and you, you started to see the results of that kind of a community where all the, the language that was used outside of the preaching was like, wasn't our, our pastor was amazing. Um, at my church, we called him the Bishop Our you know, we love the Bishop and the, it, it showed that the focus was not on building bonds with between one another, but it was about expressing loyalty to the singular man. Um, and so if you're not in a community that's building that where you're interested in one another's lives outside of the church, you know, uh, cause I think that's what people are really hungry for is, uh, yes, we want to be accountable and talk about Christian values and morality and, and, and what the scriptures say. Um, but we also want someone that is genuinely concerned, you know, that's not always like pushing the Bible in my face, but that says, you're like, how are you doing today? You know, um, and if we disregard that aspect of church and make it solely about like your attendance is um, parallels your salvation, then I think we, we, we can definitely become, it can become a dangerous place. Yeah, it's interesting. While you were saying that, I was just thinking, you know, I don't go to church four times anymore a week, um, but I have more community than I feel like I ever did um, going to one of these churches where we went four and five times a week um, because, yeah, we just have a Sunday service at my church, Um, But then we have our community group and then we have optional Bible studies we can plug into. We have optional, you know, discipleship programs that I've been able to plug into. I have a mentor now that I've talked about in our last episode that has just been so amazing. Just someone, uh, someone much older than me at the church sitting down with me. Hey, how was your week? How can I pray for you? What's God been showing you? Um, What have you been struggling with? Uh, And that's been just amazing amazing um, for my spiritual life and even just asking like, Hey, how's your prayer life? You know, and that's something I never had before for all those times I went to church. I didn't have community. That was, it it wasn't there. It was all about the church. It was all about the the preacher and listening to the preaching. Um, And that's something I I didn't even realize that I was missing out on it because you know, I thought if anyone has community, it's us who go to church four and five times a week. And I had no idea that, you know, we didn't even have a structure with life on life interaction. Um, like I said, as, aside from like going out to eat occasionally together. Uh, oh, man, I so many thoughts. Um, but I'm actually going to go on here because I want to point out that the traditional, the tradition of throughout church history of the church, the universal church, has been, as far as a worship service, to be, for it to be one time a week. And this um, must be twice on Sunday, must have a midweek service as a requirement of Christianity. This is a new invention. This is something from the 1800s. And that's something we need to, to sit with um, and recognize before we force it on others and guilt others into it. So um, this is a quote, the midweek meeting had its beginnings in prayer meetings that were occasionally mentioned before the year 1800, but became popular through the efforts of Charles Finney and D.L. Moody in the 1800s. Moody held noon prayer meetings in conjunction with his preaching campaigns during the years 1857 through 1858. 
An awakening occurred that was called the prayer meeting revival. By 1900, prayer meetings or midweek services became common in most evangelistic and Protestant churches. By the mid-1900s, the prayer emphasis of the midweek service was replaced by teaching or preaching service. So basically what we had um, were just three services that was the same. It was, you know, on repeat. Um, And then for the Sunday night service... Long story short, it was the Industrial Revolution. People start working in factories, the invention of electricity. Now we have the ability to have a nighttime service. And it wasn't like, oh, we have lights. Let's go to church twice on Sunday. It was, okay, people are working in factories. They have a morning shift um, and they can't get around that. So let's offer them a nighttime service. And that is how the Sunday night service began. And then, especially in the fundamentalist and hyper-fundamentalist churches, they're like, okay, now let everyone go to both. Um, It's kind of like my church, you know, we have a 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. service. And it's like if that turned into everybody starts going to 9 and 11. Um, Naomi, before we move on, do you have any thoughts on this? It just sounds very American in a way of like, more is better. It's like, no, not necessarily, because uh, let's make sure we have time to read our Bibles for ourselves, too, because that's really where things can doctrinally uh, fall through the cracks when we're not doing that. And so I just that's why I started smiling is because I just hear this like it's like American gluttony for church attendance. Like you guys, they're too much of a good thing can just be too much. Mm -hmm. And so even if it's a totally theologically sound church, I mean, I remember when I met my husband, if I can give just a short story, and he was in his early 20s at the time, and every single night he was doing something with the church, whether it was Friday night, volleyball, and barbecue. And so like there were activities, it wasn't just services, but he realized he couldn't just be alone with God. It's like he just he was like, wow, he'd be alone with God. He'd be like, I'm going to play a video game. You know, so it was like a real like learning that he had to go through of like, OK, like I can just read God's word. And he did do that in the morning and he did, you know, he had his Bible reading time and he had some devotional time and he would journal. And so he did all the things. But he was like, I didn't know just to have empty time that wasn't scheduled. And the church is actually where he learned that because he hadn't come from the church. He wasn't didn't come to Christ till he was 17. So it was actually church community that sort of got him on that track that he had to then unlearn. And there's beauty in being able to sit and look at that tree like I did as a kid and just know God is here. There's beauty in that. That is precious time with him. And we want to make sure we have space for that. We have space to read our Bibles for ourselves. We have space to think. Yeah. Margin is so important. That's a lesson I'm currently learning. Um, it, but yeah, so it's like, we have this idea, well, if one sermon, sermon, regular service is good, then three must be better or four or seven some weeks. Um, but at what cost? Yeah, it might be marginally better. We might learn a little bit more from three sermons than one sermon, but at what cost? If it's costing us discipleship opportunities with our family, if it's costing us our personal time to reflect and just go on a nature walk, uh, you know, and spend time in the word um, and have that calm, if it's costing us the ability to do outreach, um, whether that's sharing the gospel or practical serving our community, if it's costing us all these things, then maybe it's not worth it. And that's the other point I just wanted to mention about the church I go to now. Yeah, we have the one traditional service, just like the, the church for the last 2,000 years, what our the tr- tradition has been, that's what we hold to. And yet, I, yeah, I probably still do meet with church people three and four times a week, but it's not just in the context of a regular service with a sermon. It's because there's an outreach opportunity. It's because we're preparing for a missions trip. It's because, you know, I'm meeting with a mentor or we're going to the pastor for counseling and all these other opportunities that we have now. So there's no lack of faith community there. Um, But one more point before we get, Naomi, I'm really going to want to hear you talk about those for those people that it's not a safe season for them to go to church. But before we get to that, the the one other myth I want to mention is the danger of people becoming spiritually dependent on church. Um, One saying that I heard many times growing up was, I couldn't make it from Sunday to Sunday without a midweek service. I don't know how people do it who miss the midweek service. I couldn't make it. Um, And, you know, back then we thought that was so spiritual to say, but now I'm like, ooh, 
that's dangerous. We couldn't make it spiritually from Sunday to Sunday without, you know, another, basically a Sunday service on Wednesday. Um, so there's this dependency on church that's not healthy. And then, yeah, I think that's why when people go through that transition period where they're leaving an unhealthy church, um, they feel backslid- backslidden and they feel apart from God because they don't have their church fixed. And, oh man, that's a whole nother conversation. We grew up in very emotional churches. So it was like an emotional high every service. You shout, you get to cry, you get to scream, you get to run. Um, and then it's like, you get a high. And then like people talk about, man, I couldn't make it through the week without that, which is, oof, man, not healthy. There's this dependency on church, but back to, okay, now people have to transition out of an unhealthy church. They don't want to be re-victimized. They don't want to just jump into another unhealthy church, but they feel um, apart from God. That's a very real struggle. Uh, I'd love for you to speak to that, Naomi. And then also not just that anxiety that comes from being out of church, but also um, the well, I'll have you speak to that first, and then I want to to talk about the how some people are triggered by going into a church due to spiritual abuse. But first, Naomi, I'll just have you um, speak to to the first, which is that anxiety of not having a church to go to after we just left one. I would just caution anyone who's feeling that. One, you may be someone who's going to want to be in another church sooner than sooner rather than later. Now, I would ask questions as to why that is. And I'm not saying that because I would discourage it, generally speaking. I'm saying that because knowing that motivator might be helpful in making decisions as to what's actually going to be the next best step for you. If it is because of, Natalie, what you're saying, like, I'm afraid I'm outside of God's will. I'm I'm no longer under a covering, quote unquote, which is a whole separate conversation. But, you know, if it's something like that and you're like, gosh, I just have to be in one, whether I'm dissociating and leaving my body and imagining ripping my skin off and running down the street or not, (laughs) you know, that's okay. Well, let's talk about that because that would actually be dangerous. To, to your mental health. So I would back up and I'd start with those questions of, okay, why am I anxious about not being in a church? What kind of support do I need to talk this through? I want to make sure that I'm going to choose a healthy church community. Do I know how to do that? And if not, who can I reach out to to help me figure that out? Because I do want to get back into a church sooner rather than later. That's a beautiful thing. That is, if that is you, find the support you need to make sure that you land somewhere healthy. Those resources exist. I know Natalie comes alongside and helps in different ways. Being bold and has resources to help with that. Let's help you find and vet a church community to make sure that it is not going to be one that is harmful, either in character of the leadership or in doctrine. So that would be my sort of brief answer to anyone who's like, I need to get back in somewhere. Pause always pause. I will start there with any tip I'm ever going to give anyone. Slow down. You have likely not been taught that that's okay. So let's start there. You have permission to slow down. Jesus walked away from crowds, y'all, and he only had three years. If God himself could walk away from crowds when he only had three years, you can pause to gather your thoughts and seek wise counsel. You have permission to do that. Please do that. So pause first, seek that wise counsel, figure out who that's going to be for you, get some information, and then take your next step forward. Yeah, that is good. Man, I just realized all those 40-day fasts in the wilderness, whether it was a Jesus or another biblical figure, they didn't have community for that time. Um, and so, you know, maybe we'll spiritually survive uh, for that season of just, you know, us and focusing on the Lord and focusing on trying to learn how to vet a church community. And it's not, we shouldn't feel that panic. And maybe we do, and maybe we should, you know, work through that. But there's not a a rational biblical reason to be panicked um, if we have to go a season between churches. Um, But Naomi, I really want to hear you speak to those people um, where it's not safe for them to go to a church community. And really, I want, I'd love for you to speak to our audience that just does not understand that. That was so blatantly obvious in the comments today. People are just like, I can't believe people like triggered by going to church. I mentioned like I was asking if anyone has had a panic attack induced by church service and people were just 
so offended by that notion. And someone said, you know, the only reason that would happen is because they have sin um, that, <laughs> they're, <laughs> that they're triggered by and that they can't take preaching. But, um, oh, man, it's so it's so ignorant. So please uh, help us understand that. Help us have compassion uh, for those who are triggered by a church service. Yeah. And I think part of that is a misunderstanding of what religious abuse is. So let's put it in a context briefly to make a point of something that's going to hopefully be more easy to understand. If someone was sexually abused by someone in a place of leadership, okay, like let's, let's take it there. Let's just, again, this is a less argued topic. So I think it's a, it's a good one to use as, as an example. If someone was sexually abused by somebody else, no one would say, hopefully, I actually is said, so it's not ironclad. It does get said. But go back in and why would you even feel upset? Like you should be totally fine. I mean, most emotionally mature, spiritually mature, rational sound adults are not going to say that. We're going to say, no, that makes sense that that would be triggering. In fact, that is unsafe. Why on earth would you ever do that? Now, even walking into an environment that is similar can give us that response. Religious abuse is going, abuse, abuses are different, but they're also the same. Abuse is a misuse of something. We're talking about a misuse of position, a misuse of power, a misuse of doctrine, Okay, and we're talking about it in the context of what matters the most for our lives as Christians, which is our faith system. It's our belief system. It's how we live our lives. And so when that is used against us, when that is used outside of how it's supposed to be and it's used to hurt us, that touches every single aspect of who we are and how we live. It touches everything. So for someone to say, I have had a religious abuse experience, I am now trying to walk back into a community that prayerfully is so very different, but gosh, it looks exactly the same, or goodness, it looks and feels really similar, and I thought that it was good before, and now I've realized it wasn't. I thought it was right before. I thought it was sound before. I realized it wasn't. How do I know that I'm going to catch it this time? How do I know that this is safe? How do I know that I'm safe? How do I know that God's safe and he's going to alert me? How do I know any of this stuff? We've got major trust issues going on. Can I trust myself to identify a healthy church? Can I trust these other people that they mean what they say and that it's accurate? I can, ch I can check doctrine, but gaslighting is a lot harder to catch, right? And so, and can I trust that God's going to, like the Holy Spirit's going to alert me and convict me to turn the other way because I'm not sure where he was before. Very fair question. We answer that question all the time. So for people who are going through those experiences, we hear you and I have been there. It doesn't mean you're going to stay there forever if you don't wish to stay there forever. I have literally gotten to a point in my own healing journey where I had accepted, not happily, but I, grievously, I had accepted, I may just never be able to be a consistent member of a church community. I just don't know if I'm going to be able to do it because I would dissociate. And it wasn't minor. I had a period of my story where it was so bad that I felt like there was a rubber band in my brain that was so tight it was going to snap. And I knew, thankfully, because of my master's in social work and my training in trauma, I knew that something very serious was going on physiologically. I could feel it. And I remember telling my husband, babe, if I don't step back, because he was on staff at the time, I said, if I don't step back, I have a feeling I'm going somewhere and I'm not coming back. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to be me anymore. Something's wrong. I ended up finding the right mental health support that I needed at that time and found out, because I didn't know this at the time, that when someone is dissociating in that way and for that length of time, it can evolve. It can go into multiple personalities disorder. That is a lot harder to heal from. Now, it can still be done. It's a lot bigger of a deal. So thank 
God, I stepped away and my husband supported me in doing so. So you guys, I share that to tell you, this can be really serious and this can be very dangerous. People talk about mental health like it's some joke. Like, no, this is serious stuff. So if you are someone who is being highly triggered, if you are someone who is walking in and literally envisioning yourself, like I said, tearing your skin off and running out the door or dropping to the floor and curling up into a ball and just crying and shaking, it's taking everything in you to stand upright, but you are not really fully in your body. You should not be in that building right now. You need to step out. You are not lost, and this is not a life sentence. Just in the past year, now I was able to move past that several years ago, but it still then took time for me beyond that struggle that I was having. It's just in the past year that I have been able to be a consistent member of a church community and not just like, oh, I'm capable. Like, I finally get to do something I've wanted to do because I also hit a point where I didn't want to be isolated and alone anymore. I wanted that for a while. I wanted to walk in and not be seen and walk out. As soon as I was known, it felt like expectation. I had to hightail it out of there. I couldn't handle it. Now it's like, no, I desired. I want those deep, rich relationships. And I'm willing to take a calculated risk of vulnerability to get them. And I'm actually able to do it too. And I get to serve and I get to be a part of it. And I'm so thankful by God's grace and his mercy and this commitment to keep going that Again, by His grace and His mercy that I have, I'm glad I have that commitment and to be able to keep moving forward that I get to enjoy that now in my life when I never thought I might get to do it. And so I pray that for all of you. I hope that for all of you. But please know that you are not lost. You are not damaged. You are not any more broken than any other person walking around on this earth right now. And God is going to be there with you right where you are right now and any way that I myself with Be Emboldened or Natalie with Berean Holiness and Andrew with his role, any way that we can be there to be a part of it, it is an honor and a privilege. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that. Um, and we're about to end on that note. Andrew, I'll let you share your just closing thought and then Naomi, I'll, I'll have you pray us out after that, uh, Andrew. Yeah, so I'll just add to that uh, just a little bit, just because I think you said it uh, masterfully. You know, it, I think it's uh, important to recognize that you know, uh, not being in a church community for a time is not a, is not a life sentence, and we're made to feel that it is, especially because most people that I've seen that come out of hyper fundamentalism and toxic churches, cults, and cultish churches is. These are the ones that were the most dedicated, and it, that was in my case that we were, we wanted so desperately to serve God in the way that we were told, and so it, it, it that's why it's so much more devastating when you become aware of biblical error and you start seeing the toxicity and the abuses that go on behind the scenes, which are are terrible, and would you know cause most people, a lot of people, to just turn away entirely. Uh, to me, I kind of equate it to um, just like in the natural when you experience an injury, right? If you're genuinely concerned about the function of like, say, you 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 broke a limb, you broke a bone, you, you need time to nurse that and to seek out assistance and help, you know, where you don't understand, you know, the function of the body in that area, right? And, and that's why I'm so grateful um, for uh, groups like uh, yours and Natalie's, you know, Berean Holiness and uh, Be Emboldened, because these are resources that I before didn't know existed. And now that I do, it gives me kind of uh, terminology to recognize what I was seeing, uh, to, to give, um, to validate my experiences and to also orient me into the d directions that are healthy because my, my, um, uh, I was extremely sincere when I left the church that I, I didn't want to be lost. I didn't want to go um, it, it, and forego a relationship with God. I wanted to go deeper. And um, it's good to know that there are communities out there that help to orient you and, and, and in your time and recognizing the damage that's been done and trying to heal from those before getting fully committed into something, I think is super important. So that was the only part I wanted to add is that I'm grateful that 
that your groups do exist because it helps, you know, folks that are injured from these kinds of environments to heal um, and, and to really get plugged into a community that Christ really had intended um, according to the word. Thanks for adding that. Um, and Naomi, if you have any closing thought for our audience, and then if you don't mind to just pray for them, and that'll conclude this episode. Yeah, I think I'll close us in prayer. I think I'll put my my closing thoughts there. So thank you for the opportunity. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing all of us to be here together not just the three of us, but everyone who's listening, everyone who's watched this episode. May you show up in the words that we've given. May you offer encouragement. May you offer hope. May you offer conviction where it's needed. May you help remind that you are present. Because God, sometimes truly it's so hard to remember. And sometimes it can be hard to tell amidst all of the things that we're feeling and we're dealing with. So as we take this moment to pause and to slow down and to quiet, please remind all of us that you are here and that you are in it and that our story does end with joy and with hope. And us remembering that right now can help fuel us to continue. And whatever the rest of our lives are going to look like, whatever the rest of this journey is going to look like, may everyone who has heard this episode, Lord, remember the freedom that they have in you. Remember what holiness really is. May they, may they feel emboldened to move forward, whatever that looks like, whatever it is that you have for them. I am so personally thankful for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for what you've done in Natalie's life and Andrew's life and what you're doing in all of the lives that everyone is listening to, Lord, because as we all step forward, other people step forward and other people step forward and whatever it looks like in their circles, Lord, the narrative can change. And may we all be encouraged <clears throat> that our narratives then get to impact the narratives of others. Thank you for your grace in that. It's in your precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's episode. Please consider following, subscribing, and leaving a five-star review. The Not Ashamed podcast is brought to you by Berean Holiness. We'll see you next month with another episode. But until then, check out the Berean Holiness website and social media for more content. May God richly bless you on your journey of rebuilding faith and discovering the gospel of grace.